and now we'll begin. Uh, so as I said, welcome to our built environment or be well pod meeting uh, for the month of May. Um, we will get started with our presenters in just a second. But for those of you who are new to this space, I wanted to just give a little bit of a background uh, about who we are and what we stand for. Um, First and foremost, and, and very importantly, we want to just uh, mention that as a land grant institution, the Be Well Pod acknowledges the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Tovangar, which is the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. Uh, and uh, we we stand with UCLA and making sure that we make this acknowledgement at the beginning of all of our meetings because uh, we believe this is very important. Um, the built environment pod, the built the built environment well uh, pod or be well for short, uh, this is our mission. Um, we are uh, uh, here to catalyze changes to the built environment at UCLA in ways that promote health, safety, and sustainability for UCLA and the communities it serves. And we do that through collaboration with campus and community leaders uh, in ways that identify, plan, and implement best practices to create clean, green campus spaces that facilitate safe and active transportation, integrate physical activity into everyday life, reduce stress and promote social engagement. Um, we also seek to raise awareness about the potential to build, uh, to uh, uh, the potential of the built environment to positively impact health, happiness and well-being. And so we choose these various topics every month um, because those are connections between health and the built environment. And today's topic of conversation is no different than that. This is our amazing team. My name is Monica Schenker. I'm the graduate student researcher for this pod. We also have Dave Karwaski and Dick Jackson as our uh, an incredible and impressive pod leaders, as well as Paula Preda, who is our undergraduate pod assistant. So let me take us through our agenda today. We have two incredible presentations um, lined up for you. First, Juan Matuti is going to present on safe streets advocacy along the Santa Monica and UCLA hospital corridors. Uh, and then Madeline Brosen is going to talk about a study that was recently conducted um, by herself and her research team on LA bus riders and whether or not they're protected from extreme heat at bus shelters across LA County. This will be followed by a discussion and then a few announcements and we'll wrap up our meeting. Um, just so that uh, uh, we keep this meeting flowing, it's only an hour long, I wanna make sure that we hold our questions uh, until the end of both presentations. So we'll have the back-to-back -back presentations by Juan and Madeline, and then we'll do some Q&A. So with that, let me present our uh, two speakers. Uh, Juan Matute is the Deputy Director of the UCLA Institute of Transportation Studies. Uh, he researches public transit, transportation finance and governance, new mobility and parking. And he's led UCLA's work um, on two strategic transit plans for the state of California and long range climate action plans for two Southern California communities. Uh, he's worked with research teams to quantify parking spaces in LA County, assessing life cycle environment impacts of the LA metro system and examine the cost effectiveness of GHG reductions for the California high speed rail. Uh, Madeline Brosen is Deputy Director of the UCLA Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies and a transportation researcher focusing on connecting research to equitable policy outcomes. Her research focuses on the transportation needs for vulnerable populations and how transportation connects people to opportunity, most recently focusing on transportation needs to healthcare. Her previous research includes work on parklet design and evaluation, park design for older adults, and street performance metrics. She previously managed the UCLA Complete Streets Initiative, was the founding editor-in-chief for Transfer Magazine, and is a member of the Investing in Place Advisory Board. So we have two incredible speakers, and without further ado, so you don't have to hear me keep talking, I'm going to pass it on to Juan Matute uh, to begin our presentation. Thank you, Monica. Uh, for that great introduction. Um, so in my various roles at UCLA, um, I help manage our transportation research, which includes um, you know, some work on active transportation and transportation in communities. Uh, but then also I've been the chair of the Campus Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, for this past year and will be chair uh, continuing into next year. And there's a lot of connections between a healthy campus and how people get here. And I wanted to highlight some of those uh, today and some opportunities that the campus community has coming up. Next slide, please, Monica. So um, the Campus Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, started up uh, this past uh, late summer and fall. And uh, it's composed of about uh, a little over a dozen um, 
individuals from across campus uh, who've been meeting monthly uh, with the help of UCLA Transportation and Emily Hahn, the Active Transportation Planner. And um, in coming together, we had some discussions about, okay, what are our common interests? What should we think this group should do? Um, and uh, we're able to, around the December meeting, come up with a list of priorities for things that we wanted to work on uh, in our first year. Um, as we've learned, I think any of us who've worked in government or the university, sometimes take, things take a little bit longer uh, than being able to accomplish in your first year. And so a lot of these goals are gonna carry over in our second year. Um, but those priorities are working with the new Council District 5 council member, that's Katie young Yaroslavsky, uh, for Westwood Boulevard bike lanes. Uh, so there's a new opportunity after 13 years of having a local council member opposed to uh, Westwood Boulevard bike lanes to have um, uh, some changes to that street. And I understand that this council member is quite interested in those changes. Uh, the addition of a pedestrian scramble at Gailey and Strathmore and a speed hump at the top of Gailey. Uh, these are important to the USAC and the facilities commissioners and the USAC representation on the uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee. Advocating with UCLA Recreation to reopen the on-campus bikes shop, which I think has been moving forward with breakneck speed for university pacing. And uh, I understand there will be more announcements later about uh, the progress there. Um, uh, adding bike maps with bike parking info. Uh, the campus is beautiful, and one of the ways we've kept it beautiful is by hiding bike parking, uh, but that makes it hard to find. <laughs> and then increasing uh, visible signage for bike parking. So these two are uh, related. So this is a, a snapshot of what we've been working on uh, as a group over the past year, and I wanted to uh, get into some of the, um, the number one in particular, and then other connections, bike connections to campus. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so um, the way that the city of Los Angeles, which surrounds UCLA, approaches uh, safe streets improvements is um, often through uh, studies and then later on implementation. And so the um, uh, Campus Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, drafted and sent a letter uh, to the interim general manager of LADOT, Connie Llanos, uh, and the um, uh, council members in districts five and 11, which uh, surround UCLA assets on the west side, uh, to express our support uh, for um, that planning study and uh, our willingness to participate in it uh, to um, uh, make sure that the campus community can both get to campus and get between uh, UCLA facilities that exist uh, in, the, um, in, the, in this uh, CD5 and CD11 corridor. And so um, we've been working on that in conjunction with uh, an LADOT staff person who attends our monthly meetings. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to give everybody an idea of the map of um, this area that will be under study. And so, um, you know, at the top of the map, we have obviously the campus UCLA. Uh, UCLA is huge. Um, I mean, not in terms of total size. Nareet can tell us the total uh, uh, acreage of the campus. I know it's the most dense you see, but we're sprawling in terms of footprint across uh, the west side. And some key elements of that footprint are uh, where people live. So University Village and Apartment South near the 405 in Palms. Thank you, Nareet. Uh, and uh, the newer Boulevard apartments uh, concentrated around Santa Monica Boulevard and uh, Westgate, which has been a key part of the UCLA health and med school strategy to attract and retain uh, fellows and uh, residences, residents. Um, because this, uh, these apartments are located pretty much smack dab in between the places where people are expected to report. And more importantly, as I've learned, as I've had doctor friends, uh, expected to have a 20 minute on call response. <laughs> and that's very difficult on the west side many hours of the day. Um, and so one of the things that we note in the letter is that uh, these areas under study, so these are in the um, uh, blue shaded and then um, dotted dashed outlines, uh, do interact, uh, do, do connect uh, some of these UCLA housing assets 
uh, with the campus in general, uh, but also the, uh, the medical center and um, existing bicycle facilities that, uh, that connect with UCLA and Santa Monica. And so I think there is an opportunity um, for the campus community uh, writ large, so beyond the Campus Bicycle Advisory Committee to, to work and advocate for these safe cycling uh, connections um, with an understanding of it enabling <laughs> uh, that 20, you know, plus e-bikes, plus bicycle connections, enabling a reliable 20 minute call time response, uh, which is really important. And I'm sure uh, those involved in the medical community can tell us how important that is for um, the operations of a medical facility and, and, and patient care, uh, but then also can be uh, something that everybody uh, benefits from, whether or not they're heading between UCLA facilities to a UCLA facility or just anywhere else on the West side. Uh, so I wanted to share in, in getting you all excited about some of the possibilities, one of my, uh, my sketch planning ideas for um, these types of connections uh, before uh, taking, uh, some, addressing how people might be involved. And so the um, connection between Westwood and uh, the village, LeConte Avenue and UCLA's property with the bike lanes in Ohio uh, is under study and I think there's a lot of momentum around. That doesn't mean it's instantly going to happen, uh, but it's heading in the right direction after being stalled for so long. Um, one of the things I've learned in cycling from Santa Monica every day uh, on Ohio is um, that, and, and, and just as I do more uh, exposure to safe cycling, that really having these protected bike lane type facilities and off-street facilities um, plus bicycle boulevards is a vital part of connections. So even an on-street uh, bike lane is limited in its ability to provide uh, safety and the assurance of safety. So there's both actual and perceived safety. And so I see the potential for as part of this project advocating for a protected bike lane connection that actually uh, utilizes the north side of Ohio and then existing facilities that go through Westwood Park, which are, is a nice uh, way to get off the street and away from the cars uh, to connect uh, to Westwood Boulevard or to, to connect closer to campus. Um, there are also many other improvements that can be made. So this is the area where those boulevard apartments are. There's University High School here. In 2028, by 2028, we're gonna have a subway station right here, which is really awesome. We're also going to have one on campus. Um, and there's actually a way to make uh, safe cycling connections, uh, potentially through the VA campus as part of um, some West Side mobility improvements. Uh, Caltrans and City of LA are also making some considerations of what to do about Santa Monica Boulevard. I think given the bus service there, that's a good place for bus lanes. Um, it is a corridor that cyclists can use, but um, I think cyclists uh, do better. And, and, and so more people will cycle uh, when it is uh, when it's more peaceful. And so those off street facilities on lower volume roadways are a key part of that. And so did we have another slide, Monica? I just wanted to, if not, I wanted to open it up for some uh, other bike program updates. So I can take questions about this idea, how you can all advocate. Um, but this is, exists as part of like one of the many, um, you know, there are many improvements happening. Uh, I understand that there's going to be a new Metro bike share station outside of Santa Monica Hospital, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, there's Metro bike share throughout the West side. Uh, we did have Ruin bike, Breeze bike share in West Hollywood had pedals and those went away uh, during the pandemic and Metro's bike share offering is expanding. Uh, to replace some of those offerings. Um, I participated in a lead, uh, smart cycling class and UCLA Transportation helped uh, people learn how to become lead cycling, smart cycling instructors, uh, which was great. The campus bike shop is going to reopen. They're currently recruiting for a supervisor. I don't know if Emily can provide a stat status update on that. But if you wanna see the place, um, we're gonna have a, well, I guess that's just for our committee. Uh, but if you wanna get more involved in the bike committee or in, in the bike community at UCLA, it's bike month. And um, 
uh, Emily and others at UCLA Transportation will be operating pit stops, uh, which you don't have to arrive on bike to come to, uh, although it's a better way to go. And uh, those will be at 7.30, 9.30 at Westwood Macant on Tuesday of next week. And then Wednesday. Oh my God, I can't believe I forgot to put the date. Yeah, they're next week. <laughs> and 8.30 to 10.30 from uh, at, in front of Louisville Commons. And if you aren't sure about whether or not your bike is in good shape to come to Bike Week, there's a mobile bike repair at the Court of Sciences starting in 50, 41 minutes. So uh, you can get it in tip top shape. All right. That was great. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, I'm going to keep us moving. Uh, you are excellent time management. You're exactly on time there. Um, I think uh, as we're transitioning over to Madeline's um, presentation, however, if you uh, all in the in, in the room have questions for Juan, feel free to drop them into the chat so he can mull over them uh, until we get to the Q and A portion of our of our meeting today. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to pass it off to Madeline Rosen to present on. Uh, the study that she conducted with her research team um, on heat and transit stations in LA County. Madeline, take it away. All right, I'm gonna take over the screen here. Uh, can you see the slides? Great, okay. <laughs> um, all right. Um, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to actually tag team with Juan. We're usually just in administrative meetings and don't actually kind of get to talk about what we're actually doing. So it's uh, always a good opportunity. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about a study that uh, the UCLA Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies did uh, that was released earlier this year. Um, this was in partnership with Move LA. Move LA is a transportation advocacy organization um, in Los Angeles County. And they actually approached me last summer uh, because they were really interested in trying to advance state legislation around bus shelters um, and wanted to kind of get a sense of like, where's our baseline? You know, there had been reports, LA Times articles, um, but really trying to get a better understanding and in trying to speak legislative language, you know, also kind of be able to tell either state senators and state assembly members what these trends look like in their districts. So um, this is a picture of a bus shelter. And so for every one stop like this that has a shelter in, uh, we just looked at the stops that Metro provides service to. There are, Juan probably knows the number, a lot more transit operators in the county, um, but Metro is certainly like the biggest player. There are over 12,000 Metro, um, 12,000 bus stops that, are oper that operate LA Metro service. So it's a, it's a really big, um, kind of really big piece of the pie. So for every one stop like this, where people have shade, um, there are three stops like this, where it's pretty much just a signpost. So what we were able to do when working with um, Act LA, oh, Act LA, another partner, different projects, um, Move LA, is they actually helped us connect with Metro directly because, um, because they have 12,000 stops, we could not go and audit um, something at that scale. So the data, the, the results you're going to see are actually pulling directly from um, Metro's database. They have done a lot of different um, ways to actually um collect these data they collect them from local municipalities they do uh you know some kind of uh, auditing so that they have this uh, um, data we were able to analyze at scale and actually Juan really helped us because part of what we had to do was figure out how to get that data from the back end of their server <laughs> So part of what motivates this, um, and I think is useful to this group, is just about um, heat and heat exposure. So this map is um, giving you a sense of what land surface temperature looks like in the summer. This is uh, data from uh, what's called EcoStress, which is a data set um, that Climate Resolve um, provided to us that they had uh, purchased access to. To give you, um, so, you know, you have the air surface, you know, what's the temperature outside? Land surface is really how much heat is coming back 
from um, kind of from the surfaces themselves. So land surface temperature is actually even more important to um, to kind of understanding how people feel heat. And uh, there's a great group of, of interdisciplinary scholars at UCLA that are just working on kind of heat effects. And part of that, they're actually doing some bus shelter stuff. So you can see here that these, um, you know, you do have really, really hot areas, those black areas in the north, in kind of the north high desert. But a lot of kind of the central parts of LA, these deep purple areas, are already having um, land surface temperatures in the summer that are over 100 degrees. Um, and then in the future, you're going to have like one in three days um, in some communities that are going to be considered extreme heat. So it's already a problem and it's going to get worse. So we, with the data that we had about bus shelters, about bus stops, and whether each bus stop had a shelter, we essentially just cut the data in any and every way that we could. So here's a look at how the those stops are distributed in terms of those heat bands. So you can see um, these relate to the exact colors on that last map. This third, four, um, kind of second from the hottest, that's where the majority of the bus stops are located. Um, but it doesn't really matter whether you're in a place that has high temperatures or low temperatures, you know, this kind of one in four average of 25% of bus stops without shelters holds um, no matter what. And obviously it's most important, um, you know, that we try to prioritize getting shelters in those hottest places, but understanding that is pretty much most of our bus stops in general. So another way that we looked at this was understanding what percent of bus stops have shelters by each city. This is particularly important because it is the local municipalities that have the authority. Um, part of what makes uh, the provision of bus shelters uh, bureaucratically difficult is kind of a bit of what I describe as like a Spider-Man pointing meme where, uh, you know, the cities are not responsible for providing service. And in a few cases, you know, Metro provides a service, but the actual, where the stops sit, that is the jurisdiction of local municipalities. So it's the local cities that are actually contracting and provide, you know, are, are providing shelters, whether it be through them providing it directly through a contractor, um, there, there are different approaches to do that. And in our in the report, and I'll, I'll put a link in at the end, you know, different places kind of navigate this bureaucratic relationship in different ways um, and thinking about how to kind of create partnerships. So you can see that this is really where that kind of 25% um, really starts to vary. There are a lot, there are cities, and it's not really clear of like what's kind of the pattern here. So you have some small, like lower income, lower resource source cities, like especially you see this cluster in kind of Southeast cities that have a really high proportion of their bus stops that have shelters. And then you have other cities, like um, I always like to point out Beverly Hills, very well resourced city. There is one bus shelter in all of Beverly Hills. And that one bus shelter was built for the streetcar. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you take the two bus, when you're passing the Beverly Hills Hotel, you will see this like pink, really kind of um, this nice bus shelter that was built for the streetcar and people getting to the hotel a hundred years ago. So Beverly Hills has not installed a bus shelter in a hundred years. Um, we also looked within the city of Los Angeles. This is pretty important uh, because the city of Los Angeles is just uh, has just overhauled the contract the previous vendor uh, that they were working with that had a long time contract on street furniture and bus shelters that just changed to a new a new operator, and so there's really an opportunity. Um, the I'm not going to get into the kind of ins and outs of the contract. If people are interested, we talk a little bit. Um, essentially, City of LA um, traditionally has you has allowed uh, contractors to use street advertisement as on the shelters as the revenue for which that they um, actually kind of provide more. Um, this new op, there's a lot of changes in this new operator contract. Um, the city of LA, it, 
will have more control. They will be handling the capital expenditures. There's also more of a revenue sharing um, with that advertising contract. Also, there's likely, although there's a lot of skepticism, there's likely to be more revenue as um, the shelters, a lot of shelters, I'm not sure all, will move to digital advertisements. And when you have digital advertisements, you're getting more advertisers on each bus shelter, which means more revenue. Um, City West Hollywood, if you may have seen, um, they, a lot of their bus shelters have digital advertisements, but they're also really nice. They actually also have lighting in the bus shelters, um, which is which is a really good opportunity. So we can see here that kind of some of the city council districts in kind of the central part of LA, which is really, uh, you know, where a lot of bus ridership is concentrated, have more shelters, but there's no city council district in LA that has more than a third of their bus shops have shelters. So zooming in um, to UCLA, just to kind of give a sense of what's here, you know, you can see, so in this map, and we have this, um, so this is all produced as a story map, like I said, I'll, I'll uh, put it in the chat, so you can interact with all these maps, you can click and, and see whatever you're interested in. We have this map just shows for the entire LA Metro service area that we analyzed every stop and whether that stop has a shelter or no shelter. So you can see that, um, you know, there most of the stops around UCLA um, that are operated by Metro, there's a lot of other operators in the kind of UCLA service area. Most of them do not have shelters. And part of what we see, especially kind of on Hillguard, most of the stops that do have shelters are on the campus side, which is, I think, probably where more people are getting off the bus than are waiting to get on the bus. And so on these bus stops that are, um, that are serving the two and the 761 and where people are actually waiting to get on the bus, pretty much none of those have shelters. Part of the story, which we haven't analyzed in this is a story about narrow sidewalks. Um, uh, so, you know, you have to have enough space for, uh, you know, for a bus shelter to fit um, and narrow sidewalks really constrain that. Um, so part of this, I think, you know, thinking about how you protect people from the heat is thinking about other ways that you can provide that heat protection, especially in kind of constrained right of way, which is kind of a, a creative uh, design exercise. So I'm going to stop there. I will put the story map in the chat. Um, and so there's a lot of questions, and I guess I will leave it to Monica to figure out how we want to uh, go through those questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Madeline. That was super interesting and, and also very relevant because um, he well is, is also trying to look at uh, transit stations within the UCLA campus and get feedback from those who are transit riders uh, to figure out how do we improve those in the future. So. Um, both excellent presentations from our two presenters, and I, I invite you all to give a round of applause either by clapping your hands in their screen or virtually by doing your reactions, but that was uh, really excellent. So at this point, we have a, a good solid 15 minutes set aside for Q&A, so if you have dropped a question into the chat or if you have one uh, and you're waiting to, to, to share or ask what our representatives, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask those questions. So let's get into the discussion portion of our conversation. Real quick. Ahead, Maddie, I tried for about five years never to drive and to use public transportation the whole time. Often took the number two bus downtown. And it is, as you well know, 95% um, minority, a um, lot of service folks. And in fact, as it goes through Beverly Hills, it picks up probably a lot of maids and other people who are um, deep into the service needs of a very rich community and what you've just outlined about the paucity of decent services, shelters, et cetera, is pretty sad. I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not even to talk about, the, I mean, especially in, yeah, part of the two route, there are stops that don't even have sidewalks. <laughs> It's just a hole on the side of the hill. And, and it's you stand in the heat for a long time and then four buses arrive. 
yes, anyone that would like to join my committee to have Metro actually address bus bunching, which I send uh, <laughs> notes to Metro staff and copy board members on regular occasion, please let me know. <laughs> Other questions for presenters, please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, no, go ahead, Wendy. Oh, that's all right. Go ahead, David. Dave. Uh, Juan, I was going to ask you about 17th Street in Santa Monica. I saw some news or something about the, the bike facilities there. Is there a controversy or what's the, the scoop on that? something up by michigan yes. now yeah yeah they're, they're, they they put in some protected uh bike lanes and um there i guess is controversy um and people complaining about them a lot of the complaints have to do with the slow pace in which they were rolled out and which the legibility of the the new road design to drivers was rolled out and so it was confusing to drivers um there i guess it's some concern that that would slow down the future projects in santa monica although uh they're just repaved and are working on the protected bike lane on ocean avenue since this 17th street controversy so santa monica i, I linked in the chat they have a bike plan and what that means is um at this point, it's cleared CEQA. It's, it's, you actually have a CEQA exemption right now for bike projects. Um, everything is implemented on a ministerial basis. And so what ends up happening is that um, they do construction contracts uh, that end up going on consent calendar. And there's very limited opportunity, uh, un unlike in Culver City, um, where there has been some rollback. Uh, the way that Santa Monica is doing it, where they're accepting external funds and they're guaranteeing to those external funders that they will be building certain things, uh, that there's a certain amount of projects in the queue and uh, that have already been approved and funded. Um, and I don't see the political situation that has happened in Culver City that's led to the uh, planned removal of Move Culver City um, and happening to the same extent in Santa Monica. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like the plan will be implemented pretty much straight up as it is, as your expectation. The yeah, the, um, where there is leverage is sometimes things happen quicker and sometimes things happen slower. And I like quicker, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the pandemic also made things happen slower. And so, and some staff turnover has also made things happen slower. And um, I, I do, I'll share it here because some of you may be in Santa Monica uh, when, you know, I have an interest in safe streets that extends beyond uh, <laughs> uh, my UCLA time. It's great that I get to use some of my UCLA time to advocate for safe streets to campus. Uh, but I have a group with a bunch of other transportation geeks planners in Santa Monica called Santa Monica Families for Safe Streets where we're advocating with the school district and um, uh, the city on uh, protected bike ways to uh, really help um, accommodate a rise in family e-bikes, but then also um, now that parents have more time uh, at home, working from home, uh, they're not dropping kids off in the car. They wanna walk, they wanna bike in the morning, spend some time with their kids and, um, and we need safer uh, protected lanes for our, our our children to be able to do that with the parents. Thank you. Wendy, did you have a question? Oh yeah, thanks. Um, uh, just a comment first to thank thank you both for presenting such important and valuable and information, advocating obviously through your great work. And um, I wanted to ask a quick question to Juan. Uh, I'm a, I, I do that bike route too that you're talking about, and I have lots of uh, fantasies of protected bike line, bike, bike lanes. And what, how does, how do people from a planning point of view, like how, how do they make those kinds of decisions? Because obviously those protected bike lanes like that are on 17th street now, and I think there's some on 11th or so anyway, going North, you know, uh, North, South are really great and so much safer. 
what it, how does what kind of decisions you know how do you, how does that happen or what how do you argue uh, one over the other well there's typically a series of plans and in the city of Santa Monica, there's a land use and circulation element, and then a bicycle action plan, and a pedestrian action plan, and a whole safe routes to school programming plan. And that's where the decisions really occur, where like, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then there's a very long delay between adopting that plan and actual implementation. And some of that is a question of resources available, uh, both funding for capital projects, but then also um, priorities and what the city's going to staff. Maybe if they're interested in homelessness, they're not going to staff their active transportation people. Uh, but that just really changes the pace at which the projects are rolled out. The move, um, and, and Santa Monica has pretty ambitious plans. I think um, there, was, there was a recent YouTube video, I don't know if anybody's seen it and can put it in the chat, of Santa Monica's safe streets uh, progress over the past 10 years uh, that really kind of tells the story of Santa Monica trying to take advantage of its weather and location and relatively flat, except for Franklin Hill uh, terrain, to really encourage a mode split of cycling that is in the 8% to 40% or more range, um, which is like a range that only exists in Boulder and Davis in the US right now, uh, but is common in, in other parts of the world. Uh, and, and they would have not just the infrastructure, but the complete network of infrastructure to do that. Because it's really, if you have 98% of a route feel safe, it's the 2% somebody makes a decision about whether or not they're comfortable doing that route. And Santa Monica gets that. Um, on the city of LA side, they have mobility plan 2035. They have a bike action plan. LA does things really with a lot of authority and input from the council districts in which a project would occur. And so, uh, whereas in Santa Monica, there aren't districts, um, things happen somewhat ministerially once the plans are approved. In LA, it's really important to be engaged and get the council members interested in making something happen for it to move forward. Um, and we saw the effects of having an uninterested council member on Westwood Boulevard's bike lane for 13 years. And um, there is, I think, an engagement opportunity with the new Council District 11 office about that area between the west of the 405 and to the Santa Monica's border uh, to make sure that they're interested and they understand uh, the opportunity and like all of the benefits that could come from having those connections between I, not, I mean, the, I think the benefits for the medical community are easiest to express and people will get those, but there's so many other benefits um, and so many other uh, interests that could align uh, to advocate for that. Thank you. I will have to say, um, I saw Dave recommend Sarah, who's the new sustainability officer in the health system. And she, I just met with her a couple of weeks ago and she's fantastic. I think you have an ally there. Tiffany, I think you have uh, the next question and then Dick, I have you in queue. Thank you, Monica. And I think this question might be for Madeline. I was just curious um, to understand if with the bus station shelters um, being constructed, is there a, I'm gonna use your word, David, confluence <laughs> um, between them being erected and uh, our growing uh, unsheltered population. I'm just curious to see if if that's playing a role in how quickly or how slowly um, some shelters are also being constructed. If you have um, any thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, so um, there hasn't been, so our analysis is a snapshot in time, right? So like, um, you know, we analyzed the provision of shelters as Metro had data on them last summer. Um, so I uh, don't know to the extent to which shelters are added or removed, maybe even in some cases, when there are concerns about their use 
um, divided between providing shelter from the heat for people using the system um, or people that are providing shelter from the heat because they do not have a, a home. Um, so it's, it's always a tension that exists, um, but I don't necessarily think, except with maybe anecdotal evidence, I haven't seen any specific um, action related to that. You know, it, it did come up a few years ago in our work looking at uh, transportation needs of older adults in around kind of Westlake and MacArthur Park. Um, there, there's certainly kind of tensions that they were expressing about people that were um, sheltering at the bus shelters um, and they didn't have as much opportunity to be able to use that or, or it caused them fear. So it's certainly a tension. It's a tension that exists in the transportation, public transportation system wholesale. Um, but I haven't seen it specifically about like we need to put more or put less shelters right now. But it'll be interesting to see and follow as in the city of Los Angeles, you know, they're they're going to be adding more shelters as part of this new contract, how or whether that um, that plays into the decisions of where to locate them. Thank you so much. Appreciate your insight. Thank you. Have a question. I couldn't hear you. you said me. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Oh, Go I'm ahead. sorry. Um, two weeks ago, the National Academy of Medicine uh, hosted uh, their decarbonization effort for the medical care system. We we're about 10% of the carbon footprint of the United States, about 20% of the entire GDP of the United States and um, about 10% of the US workforce. They had three major hospital chains. They had Big Pharma and they had Philips Electronics that big build some of the most expensive equipment that goes into healthcare facilities. And there has been a shift and a lot of this is being driven not by doctors and scientists, but it's being driven by uh, the Biden administration, and you have got to become much more accountable. You've got to have the numbers. Um, and striking, uh, there are, these big corporations are putting in the performance evaluations of their staff. What are you doing? And if you want a promotion, you better show that you've accomplished enough in this whole area. Uh, pharma is actually about 20% of the carbon footprint in the medical care system. It was much bigger than I realized before this started. I think there's a fair amount of funding that could be used to really push this. Uh, one is we have the California Enviro screen that OEHA puts together that tells us where the most vulnerable communities in California and the AB32 funding from cap and trade has to go first to those most vulnerable communities. And I have never, in all this discussion, Maddie, I never suggest, well, maybe um, bus shelters, since this is the population that uses them, we ought to be subventing that in a much greater way. And uh, it is negligent for a hospital, for a system to have two hospitals five miles apart and be spending more on banners to tell people how great they are than they spend on creating safe and fast ways for people to be back and forth between those two hospitals. And by the way, yes, we're taking care of, you know, uh, if you will, doctors and higher income people in a way, but you you got to start a, a bicycle system with something and then you can begin to add on to it and propagate it further. So Wendy, you and I did grand rounds in pediatrics, but maybe we need to go over and do one on with uh, Maddie and Juan on this very issue because most people are going to listen to this and go, wait a minute, this is just common sense. Why are we not doing this? And Juan gave us the reasons, political and administrative, why, but it, this is it's just common sense. I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Always amazing common stick. And, and I feel like you're saying something that I feel like I say so often in the world of build mom. Isn't this just common sense? <laughs> Why aren't we doing this? <laughs> so it's so unfortunate sometimes, but um, got to keep working and, and working hard. Uh, we have just a few more minutes. If anybody just has that burning question they'd like to ask either Madeline or Juan, please feel free to do so. Um, Anything else that, that folks want to hear from our two incredible speakers?
if that is, uh, if that was the, the, I think that ending on one of Dick's comments is always amazing. And Dick, your your hand is still raised. If you have anything else to say, I know we're always love to hear any of the any of the other thoughts that you have. <laughs> um, but if if not, I'd like to welcome you all to thank uh, thank our speakers for being here and presenting some incredibly important work. Um, Juan, Madeline, thank you for being with us today. And uh, it was very exciting to hear about the, the important work that you're doing. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So I am going to quickly share our screen once more, and we're going to just move into the announcements portion of our meeting. Uh, before I invite you all to share anything important that's going on in your world, I'm just going to make a few amounts, announcements. First and foremost, we do have a Be Well blog post up and running on our website. Uh, it's called Paid For It, Advocating for a Subway Station at UCLA. This was written by our own uh, undergraduate pod assistant, Paula Preda, and uh, it's a really excellent piece about uh, why we really do need a metro station on UCLA's campus. So take a look at that. Um, I'll also quickly drop the link uh, in the chat. Uh, let me do that quickly as I try to multitask. Oh, there it is. So there's the link. Um, we also have a focus group coming up. So speaking about Madeline's work, we also are going to be doing a focus group to ask for the campus community's opinion about uh, the impact that heat and shade has on the transit stations that are on our UCLA campus. So if you have any um, colleagues or friends or classmates uh, who uh, do take the transit system and are interested uh, in participating in this focus group. It will be happening next Friday, May 19th from four to five via Zoom. It most likely will not take a full hour. We've, we've done already three of these and they usually take about uh, 35 to 45 minutes. So please invite them to join us. Again, I'm gonna drop the RSV link into the chat. And then lastly, I wanna just make another announcement which is for our June pod meeting. We have another excellent speaker lined up, which is Dr. Howie Frumkin, who is the current senior vice president for the Trust for Public Land, but he has a lot of other accolades in his title, including having been a professor at the University of Washington School of Public Health for at least 13 years. He served as the director of the National Center for Environmental Health or the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And he has written a, a, just a really healthy amount of books and articles about uh, incredible work around the built environment and health, including making healthy places, designing and building for health, well-being and sustainability with our very own Dr. Dick Jackson. Um, but he's gonna be an excellent speaker uh, at our next June pod meeting. So I, I invite you all to join us then uh, and also um, invite your friends, colleagues, and classmates to join us, because it's gonna be a really excellent discussion about the impact that green space has on mental and physical health. If you wanna read a little bit more about Howie, here is his bio, and I encourage you to do so, because he's quite uh, impressive as an individual. Um, but those are the announcements from Be Well side. I'm just gonna open it up at this point uh, to, the, uh, to everybody in the room. If you have any announcements about important events, resources, or contacts that you'd like to share with the group, please feel free to do so. Hey, Monica, I'll just share a quick update. Um, as you guys saw on the slide, I forgot to include the dates for the Bike Week pit stops, but they are next week, a uh, week of um, May 16th and 17th. So we hope to see you guys there. And then as Juan mentioned, um, regarding the bike shop, um, the hiring of the bike shop supervisor is underway. Reopening is underway. No dates yet for sure, but keep, keep an eye out. May I just Thank you, supplement what, what you said about, wonderful Emily, I'm sorry, what you said about Howie Frumkin, he, he does the textbook of environmental health, he's done three versions of it, and this guy's done everything, but his big focus and trust for public land is behind many, many places where the allocation of huge philanthropic resources were brought to capture land and protect it into the future. So this is a whole new effort for them to be really working on parks and looking at green spaces in the most needy places in America, just as Madeline was talking about from her work, the small scale and climate and economically impacted places. So um, it's fascinating what they're doing. So I really encourage uh, even if people are in a class or something else to mention this. Thank you, Dick. And Wes, I think you have a question and I expected Dave to have a pretty quick answer. So thanks Dave for dropping that answer into the into the chat. 
Any other announcements that you'd like to make to the group today? And if not, I know that everyone's always excited to hop off of meetings a little bit early, be able to grab some food in between meetings. So, uh, you know, we're more than happy to wrap up with about six minutes to spare exactly. So thank you all for joining us today. And again, one last quick thank you to Madeline and Juan for joining us for two excellent presentations. I hope you all have a really great rest of the week. Great, thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Bye. Bye.